Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So good to see all of you. Uh, saw you last week, but uh, it seems like a long time. Uh, my wife and I have been living out of a suitcase for the last uh, week and a half, so it's kind of been a, a little bit of an unusual uh, temporary life. I guess we'll go off to the feast. We'll be used to it, you know. And then, you know, what I, I was thinking today as we drove up uh, to the hall, uh, begin services for today, you know, the, when we came here, uh, 14, almost uh, 14, and, well, it was over 14 and a half years ago, we were dream, driving over the, the ultimate pass, and it was just, a, the wind was blowing. It wasn't at my back, uh, it was coming from the right and the left, uh, and, and it was dry. I mean, all the hills were all brown and everything. And I had always heard it was green up in Northern California, and I thought, what am I getting myself into? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm jumping from the skillet into the frying pan up here uh, because it's. I was going coming from Arizona, uh, where it was fairly hot uh, up here, and I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, just as dry as a bone up here, and uh, you know, uh, sort of hot as well as it was at the time I came here, uh, you know, that particular day, but. Uh, and I was thinking also about uh, when we came, I came, I think, December of 2001, uh, and uh, Joan came later, but uh, Jonathan was, I think, 11 years old or 10 years old. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think he was in the sixth grade or so. And I, I was thinking when he was standing up here uh, speaking, I thought, no, he came here when he was 10 years old, uh, and now he's preaching at me. <laughs> it didn't take very long, did it, uh, before he started doing that. Uh, but uh, it is amazing, uh, the years that go by and uh, the, the experiences that you have, and they've all been wonderful, uh, it, generally, I, I should say that, uh, uh, because I guess we've had our moments, haven't we, uh, through the, the last years. But, and, uh, you know, it, it has been uh, an interesting uh, assignment up here in the Bay Area. Uh, Joan and I have thoroughly enjoyed every one of you. Uh, we do love you very much. And, and, you know, I know, like you say, there have been our moments and so forth with different situations, but we do love you uh, very, very much. Uh, one thing that was kind of interesting, by the way, uh, I sent an email out uh, to the elders uh, in the area uh, telling them, you know, what the progress of our move. I got an email back from, from Scott Ashley, and it was a picture of a fan, a window fan that had melted into the floor. Uh, and he said, I, I think the, the caption was, it, it's a dry heat. Uh, so Mr. Crow uh, took a jab at me, and he, he wasn't the first. So it was Mr. Ashley who did that with me by sending you know, be the picture reminding me of how hot it gets uh, down in, uh, you know, uh, Phoenix. But, but anyway, we are looking forward to getting down there uh, to see some of our old friends there. We pastored in Phoenix for 10 years, and uh, our children will be, are there as well. Uh, Sean lives about 30 minutes from us, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and Stephen lives about 25, and the church hall is about 30. Uh, so we'll be closer, actually, to services in, in uh, Phoenix than we are here, uh, even though we're going to live a, out of town in a little town called uh, Maricopa. I wanted to talk to you today. I, you know, I've given a lot of thought about what I wanted to say to you today, uh, being the final sermon, final opportunity, as Mr. Spears says, to convert you. Uh, <laughs> or really, really change you. And I, what did I say to you? Not a chance, uh, but, but anyway, hopefully I can leave you with something. In 1962, there was an old soldier. He was a five-star general. His name was Douglas MacArthur. He was 82 years of age. And I don't need to even tell you about the history of Douglas MacArthur and World War II. Of course, he was a legend. You know, he stands next to people like uh, Dwight Eisenhower and, and uh, Patton and, and many others in World War II. 
He was of, of failing health, and he returned as an honored graduate. He had been the superintendent of uh, this particular institution, West Point Military Academy, for a few years and uh, before he was assigned over in the Philippines. And he came back to receive their highest award, which was the Savannah uh, Thayer Award uh, there at West Point for his service to the United States of America. And he gave an inspiring farewell address to the graduates, to the cadets, and he was stressing the code of West Point that was inscribed on the coat of arms uh, of West Point. And you know, West Point, as you know, trained some of the top military leaders of World War II. I mentioned Eisenhower, the only six-star general that we've ever had. Uh, of course, uh, Omar Bradley was another, was a, a great uh, general that, that came out of that, that war. Uh, Patton, of course, who was sort of psychic, you know, he seemed to be a psychic kind of individual. If you ever, ever saw the movie about Patton, uh, and he would go on a battlefield and, and he would remember things that happened on that back battlefield. Uh, one wonders if, if he may have been tapped into a demon in some way. That was a, a part of, of his psyche there. Uh, Ridgeway, of course, that, that was also a, a very uh, famous in World War II. But West Point, again, uh, turned out these kind of uh, men, these, these caliber of individuals. And it, it got me to thinking, by the way, about how that there's something about an institution that has high codes, codes of honor, high standards, high values. Of course, uh, West Point is just one of those institutions. There's a, there's a number of institutions that like that that have very high standards. I remember when I was, I was probably uh, maybe 18 years of age, maybe 17 years of age, I was standing on the doorsteps of a, a Church of God Seventh Day, and somebody happened to have a, an envoy to Ambassador College. And uh, we were sort of looking through this, and by the way, this, this was the Church of God Seventh Day group. Uh, this is when I had first began keeping the Sabbath, and I was turning uh, with them through this Envoy, and it had these fabulous pictures of Ambassador College. And it, an ambassador struck me as just that kind of an institution. Uh, uh, an institution with high values. Very high values. And, and I remember saying to, to the person who was showing me that envoy, I could never go there. Because I couldn't afford it. I just couldn't afford to do it. Of course, growing up in Arkansas... You think of, of, of uh, going off to an institution like that's going to cost you a lot of money. And uh, anyway, uh, I learned, of course, uh, over a period of time more about the Bible. I learned about the holy days and so forth. And I began to attend the Ambassador College, and I decided I was, I mean, began to attend the Worldwide Church of God, and I began to think about Ambassador College. I was going to Northeastern State University uh, at the time, uh, and, and I said, well, I, you know, I... I I was in my second year, and I said, uh, I said, where should I go my third year? Should I go to Oklahoma State University, pursue my degree in, in uh, medicine, or should I go to this ambassador college? And I had worked to save money during the, the summers, and I had accumulated a sum total of $500. So, I, I mean, I was rolling in the dough. And, uh, and I said, God, if you want me to go to Ambassador College, I'm going to apply. And so, so I applied. And lo and behold, I got accepted. And uh, got on the bus to Gladewater, Texas, and headed off with my $500 in my pocket. And only when I got down there did I ask the question, how was I going to pay for this? Uh, but uh, I got to Ambassador College, and uh, when I got to Ambassador College, you know what I heard? When I was there, that Ambassador College was called the West Point of God's work. The West Point of God's work. I had applied to him to West Point during my high school years, by the way. And in the church, we looked upon Ambassador College as a place where 
you know, the ministry would be uh, trained, their wives and, and so forth, uh, in Ambassador College. It was not a ministerial college, but it was a, a liberal arts college, but it had high values. And again, there's something about an institution that does have high values that, that expects that of, of its students. And you know, in the church, brethren, in a way, the church is an institution with these high values, these very high virtues that we strive to attain, that we want to make, make a part of us. In the church, we're like cadets in training to rule someday with Jesus Christ. Right here in this room are the future kings of the earth. It's hard to believe right now, but right here are the future kings of the earth, the kings and priests of the future. You know, Paul told Timothy, who was an evangelist, he said, you endure hardness as a good soldier, he said, of Jesus Christ. You know, when you went to Ambassador College, you knew you were part of something different. And you know, when you're part of God's church, you're part of something different with high values. I'd like to reinforce, brethren, this code of conduct that was at West Point. I want to apply it to us as cadets, as it were, as students in God's church, preparing for the high roles we're going to play in the world tomorrow. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, admired the dedication and the discipline of the Roman soldier. You know, they, they had to be trained. They were very well trained and disciplined. And you know what? When Paul looked at the Roman soldiers, he charged the brethren in the church to show greater loyalty to their calling in the way that, that a Roman soldier was dedicated to being a soldier, that, that the church should be dedicated to our calling. We might say in the army of God. And we're not called to, to fight physical battles. We know that. But you know what, brethren? The principles of spiritual warfare are essentially the same. I want to read to you some of what MacArthur said. Now, I'm not going to read it as slow as, as Douglas MacArthur read it. He, he was very, very slow in how he delivered you know, this particular speech. Uh, and again, it was given in 1962, and two years later, uh, Douglas MacArthur died. Uh, but, but this is what he said. General Westmoreland, General Groves, distinguished guests. I can say to you, all of you here, you know, the Brethren of Oakland, the church in San Jose, in Santa Rosa, and our Brethren over in the Hawaiian Islands. But he said, and distinguished guests and gentlemen of the Corps, as I was leaving the hotel this morning, a doorman asked me, where are you bound for, General? And when I replied, West Point, he remarked, beautiful place. Have you ever been there? <laughs> he said, no human being could fall, fail to be deeply moved by such a tribute as this. Coming from a profession I've served so long and a people I have loved so well. It fills me with an emotion I cannot express. But this award, the Thayer Award I mentioned earlier, is not intended primarily for a personality, but to symbolize a great moral code. The code of conduct and chivalry of those who guard this beloved land of culture and ancient descent. That is the meaning of the medallion. For all eyes and for all time, it is an expression of the ethics of the American soldier. That I should be integrated in this way with so noble an ideal arouses a sense of pride and yet humility which will be with me always. This is what was engraved, by the way, on the, the uh, coat of arms of West Point. Duty, honor, and country. He says, those three hallowed words 
reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. They are your rallying points to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Unhappily, I possess neither that eloquence of diction, that poetry of imagination, nor that brilliance of metaphor to tell you all that they mean. The unbelievers will say they are but words, but a slogan, but a flamboyant phrase. He said every pendant, every demigod, every cynic, every, every hypocrite, every troublemaker, and I'm sorry to say some others of an entirely different character will try to downgrade them even to the extent of mockery and ridicule. But these are some of the things they do. They build your basic character. Duty, honor, he said, in country. They mold you for your future roles as the custodians of the nation's defense. They make you strong enough to know when you are weak and brave enough to face yourself when you're afraid. So, you know, he says he's not eloquent, but it doesn't sound that way, does it? Sounds quite eloquent to me. But, it, but he talks again, again about these three words, duty, honor, and country. Now again, <coughs> brethren, Jesus said, he said that the children of this world are in their generations wiser than the children of light. Sometimes it's amazing that in the world people, you know, see the values and the standards and the importance of those, those high standards. Now, it's true that we're living in a time where, where those high standards are not that valuable. But the world oftentimes values a high code of conduct for success. And, you know, Jesus Christ was one who valued the high standard of conduct. My son talked about, you know, how we need to depart from the perversity in our lives and, and how we need to walk in, in a certain way in our lives. Jesus Christ talked about that. Let's go to Luke chapter 14. Here he gave this, by the way, uh, to those who were seeking him. A lot of people, of course, in our time, in our day and age, say they would want to seek God. But when they find out what God requires of them, then they change their tune. But here in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, let's notice here. In verse 25, he says, Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and he said to them, It's almost like here all of these people were following Christ. And perhaps sometimes it was a bit annoying for him to have all these people following him. And Christ just turned around and he said this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So all of you people following me, unless you can, you know, be willing to follow me and love me above all of those things and God more than those things, don't follow me. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot not be my disciple. Now, brethren, that's a high standard, isn't it? That Christ was demanding from people. On down here in verse three, uh, 33, it says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You don't forsake all that you have. Now, that would have turned away 98% of those people following him. They weren't willing to do it. They weren't willing to commit themselves to this high standard. Well, brother, we must be con committed to the high code of duty, honor, and country. I'm going to tell you how that applies to our calling, brother. Like soldiers, we must be committed to fight the enemy to succeed. We have to be committed from the heart. Your brother, Satan is a formidable foe. 
And we can't win against him on our own. But we can win if we're dedicated to the cause that we're embarked upon in our calling. And we rely upon Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven. Let's go to, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reminded that when Mr. Armstrong, many years ago, uh, you know, went over to the Philippines, I think there were probably, you know, 20, 25 people, uh, 25,000 people in, in the auditorium in the Philippines. And he did, he did several nights of, of, of uh, you know, how Mr. Armstrong was. I mean, he just let it rip. And he boomed, his voice boomed, you know, uh, to the people. First night, he would have 20, 25,000 people. Second night, he would have maybe 15,000 people. Because as people heard him more and more, less and less showed up. And, uh, and then the next night, it got down to maybe a few thousand people. Still, again, an impressive turnout, but, but yet, you know, again, it, it got pared down. In a lot of ways, what, what, what Christ did, it was the same thing. There were lots of people following him uh, to begin with, but the more he said, the less it followed him. And finally, it got down to the point he asked his own disciples, are you going to leave too? Are you going to leave too? Because the standard was so high. Uh, chapter 10 of Matthew, let's notice, notice in verse uh, 34 here. It says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be of those of his own household. Now, some of you don't know what that means. You have never experienced it. But, you know, I've known of people that have, have begun to obey God and, and all of a sudden their families turned on them. And there was conflict in, in the family. I had a period of time, by the way, where my, my father did not talk to me for about two or three years because of what I was believing. Uh, you know, when you start uh, bucking against Christmas and Easter and and all the family traditions, people don't really like what you're doing, and, and you're going to be ostracized. Well, that's what God, Christ said was going to happen. In other words, you've got to have such dedication, if you're going to be one of my followers, Christ is saying, you know, you're going to have to face that. But God's ways, brethren, is more important than our physical family. God's way is more important uh, to me than my wife. I love my wife very much. But God's way is more important to her than, uh, than I am. And, you know, if I, if I left the church, she would not leave the church. And if she left the church, I would not leave the church. Because the church is the most important thing in my life has been for many, many years. I pray again, it always shall be, it will be. So God wants us, brethren, to again realize there's a high standard. And at West Point, they expressed it again by those three words of duty, honor, and country. And again, these things apply to our calling as well. Over in 1 Timothy, let's notice in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, I remember when I went to Ambassador College, uh, you know, when I, I was going to Northeastern, I, I had studied most of the time, I, I really did, I studied all the time at, at Northeastern. But when I went to Ambassador College, you know, I decided, you know, I want to become a very uh, well-rounded person. And so I decided that I would not be Mr. Egghead. 
You know, I would try to, to get involved in things. Uh, I had always been involved in the music and, and high school and so forth, but uh, I, I had not done that, pursued that at Northeastern. Uh, my main interest was, was pre-medicine, you know, mathematics, uh, you know, biology, uh, zoology, all of those types of things that, that again, uh, that one must study to, to go into medicine. And uh, I pretty much kept to myself, uh, not, not involving my soci socially with people. Uh, of course, I was striving to obey God as well. Kind of hard to do that when, and, and intermingle with some of the kids uh, that of my particular generation, because in the 60s, it was the time when pot was very popular, beginning to be very popular uh, at that time. And, and uh, you know, the, the mentality was quite different. You know, in the, and I lived in a dormitory uh, situation at Northeastern. And, uh, you know, you don't want to know what goes on in a dormitory than at a college. Uh, it really is a, an awful place. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were people that I associated with were, were, were pretty solid uh, people, the people I did associate with. But most of them were like I was, uh, sort of loners, but when I went to Ambassador College, I wanted to, again, to branch out. I wanted to become more uh, socially uh, oriented and, uh, you know, and, and to get the full value of Ambassador College. And I really strive to do that uh, at, at AC. But, uh, you know, I, the idea, too, is I wanted to get the full uh, information, the full knowledge of Ambassador College as well. I didn't want to just become a uh, you know, a, a, a theologian. I wanted to, 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 to be able to be well-rounded. In fact, I, I had not intended to go into ministry. I think I've mentioned that to you before. Uh, but you know, that was the farthest thing from my mind. I'm really happy I, I ended up there uh, in the ministry, but I, that was not my, my idea. When I went to Ambassador, I changed my major, by the way. I changed, I was going to go into business. I was going to get a business degree. Uh, but as it turned out, of course, uh, God jettisoned my ideas. In fact, God didn't like any of my ideas, I don't think. Uh, he didn't like the fact I was going to go into medicine. He didn't even like the fact I was going to go into business. And, uh, you know, and decided, uh, well, you're going to go into the field ministry. And they announced it at, at the forum with the way they did it back in those days. They didn't tell you you were going to go in the field ministry. At least they didn't tell me that. Uh, they just announced it. So and so is going to so and where, you know, wherever it was. I was going to go to Oklahoma City. I thought that would be a good place to be. And in the graduation line, they decided to send me to Pennsylvania, some place called Harrisburg, uh, which I had never heard of. But uh, but anyway, that's what happened, and I ended up again in the ministry. But, but Ambassador was a wonderful place, again, to learn high values. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 now and verse 18. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18. Here, Paul says to Timothy, This charge I commit you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Having faith and, and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the, the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so Timothy was told, he was charged to wage a good warfare as a soldier of the army of God. He, he had to be, again, the sharpest attack. There were those that, that maybe demeaned him because of his youth. And Paul said, you don't allow that in the church. And Timothy was not allowed to compromise God's way of life, but had to be absolutely loyal to God's laws. You know, he, in a way... Uh, Paul took him through Ambassador College. He taught him. 
He considered him a son. General MacArthur said there are three hollowed words to a West Point cadet that reverently dictate what we want to be, what we can be, and what you will be. Three hollowed words. And brethren, these three words should be our hallmark, our code. These three words, brethren, give us stability to fight the spiritual battles that we have to fight. So brethren, renew your bearings of what you are and what you want to be. When Jesus Christ talked about the way of God, he says, great and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few, he said, there be that find it. But broad, he said, is the way to destruction. So those that are a part of, of the those select few, brethren, that are going to be a part of that initial wave of, of the kingdom of God are the few who, again, have very high standards. So, brethren, when you feel like your life has been turned upside down, realize it's been actually turned right side up. When God begins to work with you, your, your life is being turned right side up. It only feels different. And what God is doing, brethren, is transforming you into what you should be, into his new creation. And you know, all God needs, brethren, is a few good men and women to catch the vision and dedicate themselves to the great transcendental purpose to rule with Jesus Christ and to be God's servants and the kingdom of God. To be kings and priests in the world tomorrow. Do we have that vision, brethren? You know, that really is what we've been talking about for over 14 years. The vision. It's been given many different titles and many different sermons. It's all the same message, basically. The vision of being in the kingdom of God and ruling with Jesus Christ. No duty, honor, and country for all of us, brethren. Our code is in the spiritual way is duty, honor, and country. Let's talk about duty. What is your duty to do? Well, even Jesus Christ said, if you only do what it is your duty to do, you're an unprofitable servant. So you see, his standard is pretty high, isn't it? If I tell you what your duty is, and that's all you do, Christ said you're an unprofitable servant. If you only do what you're supposed to do. But you know, even in this world that we're living in, duty is, is not spoken of very much anymore. It, say, it seems since the 60s, self-discipline de has declined with what began, I, I know, in the, the, the 60s and the 70s to do your own thing you know, attitude that people have that has per pervaded society. Remember, you know, when I was a, a, a boy hearing JFK when he was inaugurated into the presidency, I can hear it even now. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. So he taught or believed in the obligation that every citizen in this country, you know, owed a duty to the country in some way, shape, or form that needed to be paid. And of course, in, in the 60s, that all went by the wayside, didn't it? It was lost by, you know, a lot of the, the, the free sex movement that began back in the 60s and the do your own thing society that enveloped, uh, in fact, the entire country and the whole world, for that matter. <coughs> Do you have a sense of duty, brother? No. For what Jesus Christ did for you, you have a sense of duty, of owing God something, owing Jesus Christ something for what he has done. 
Do you have a sense of duty in his church to contribute willingly? You know, our attitude, brethren, is that God's wish is our command if, if we have that attitude of duty to God. We want to do what God says. We want to obey God. You know, if you really have duty, a sense of duty, as a servant of God, brethren, nobody has to make you do anything. You want to do it because you, you're obliged to do it because of what Christ has commanded us to do, uh, given to us uh, you know, in, for, in the form of his sacrifice. But uh, he's commanded us to do it, but he's not going to make us do it. But we do it willingly because we are obliged to do it. We feel obligated to do it. The word duty, by the way, uh, in Webster's is defined this way. Bound by natural law. It just is just natural. It's natural for us to, to want to do something out of duty to someone. Uh, bound by natural law, legal, moral obligation to pay or perform. That's what the word duty means. I think, I think MacArthur was right, brother, when he said, he said that these three words to a lot of people are just words, are just like slogans. And I would imagine that when I said those words, you, you may have thought in those terms. I know I've heard them before in that way. But it's, it's like the songs that were sung by the choir and, and uh, Mrs. Crow. You know, here my wife and I are sitting uh, in the last service here in Oakland, uh, talking here now to you now. I listen to those two songs differently than I have ever before. I, uh, you know, I really do pray that the wind is at our back. I, I, I pray all those Irish little sayings, you know, they're, they're sometimes are positive, you know, are, are true in our lives, that God will smile upon us, you know, that, that the sun will shine upon us. And you know what? I pray that for you, all of you too, that God will be with you. But, but these words, these words, duty, honor, and country, they look different to me now. After being, you know, in the ministry for uh, you know, four decades or so, they look different to me now than they used to. They're not just words anymore. I think, like MacArthur told, you know, the cadets, uh, this is what makes you into what you need to be. We need to be if we really see them for what they are. If we can have a sense of duty within ourselves, an obligation to Jesus Christ. They will make us what we need to be as God's people. And you know, if we have a sense of duty, a, a real sense of duty where we feel obliged, brethren, the church is not just a, a, a group that we sort of come to here. You know, we spend a little time with the, the church and then we leave. We have ownership here. We're part of this group. We're part of the family. You know, when we came here, uh, you know, many years ago, I didn't know anybody in this congregation except, I think, Mr. Roram. Uh, Mr. Roram, uh, I knew at Ambassador College. He was down there at the same time. I think he was a, a class uh, or two ahead of me, but, but uh, you know, he was the only one I knew. But now i got a whole big family. You know, Joan and I have got a family here that, of people that we know that we feel comfortable with. Uh, and, you know, you, you're gone for a week and you feel like you've been gone for two months. Uh, that kind of a family. Uh, we love you again very much. But, but it's the sense of duty that has brought us this far. It has brought us to this place, brother, that we're here with you. Uh, and a sense of ownership. I'm a part of this family. We're, Joe and I are part of this family. Hope you feel that way, brother. We're not mere servants. We're family members here. We're part of this spiritual family. We're God's kin. We're his relatives. And we're not simply passing through. 
So what was Jesus Christ's attitude, brethren? Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 over here. So brother, do you have that sense of duty? Matthew chapter 4. And chapter uh, 4 and verse just 1 through 4. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. He had a monstrous appetite. And now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. This is Jesus Christ. This is what you do. This is your duty to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you'll notice on down here uh, that Christ was taken to the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written that he shall give his angels charge over you, and into their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then the next uh, time that Satan tries to tempt him, you know, Jesus Christ says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and he, him only you shall serve. There are two things that we see here. That Christ says, as it is a duty of all Christians who follow in his footsteps, number one, to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And number two, to trust in God, to look to God and no one else. To have our minds riveted on those two aspects. On God and the word. So Jesus Christ set the example for us. He put God first. He put God's word first. And he put God first. All, and all things. You know, he didn't skirt the edge of the cliff and play with fire and, and expect God to sort of bail him out. He didn't compromise. But he served God from the heart as, his, as was his duty. He set the example, brethren, for us. Well, God wants us, brethren, to have that sense of duty. I'm going to read a little more of what uh, MacArthur said here. Talking about these three words, these hallowed words he talked about, of duty, honor, and country. He says, they teach you to be proud and unbending and honest failure. But humble and gentle in success. Not to substitute words for action. Not to seek the path of comfort, but to face the stress and spur of difficulty and challenge. <laughs> to learn to stand up in the storm, but to have compassion on those who fall. To master yourself before you seek to master others. To have a heart that is clean, a goal that is high. To learn to laugh, yet never forget how to weep. To reach into the future. Yet never neglect the past. To be serious, yet never take yourself too seriously. To be modest so that you will remember the simplicity of true greatness. The open mind of true wisdom, the meekness of true strength. They give you temperate will and quality of imagination. A vigor of emotion, a freshness of deep springs of life, a temperamental predominance of courage, over timidity, an appetite for adventure over love of ease. They create in your heart the sense of wonder, the unfailing hope of what's next, the joy and the inspiration of life. They teach you in this way to be an officer and a gentleman. Duty. Duty, brethren, honor, and country. 
will do that for us, brethren. You know, every time there's a sense, there's a battle, brethren, we, we think of the sense of duty that we have. And if we have a, a deep sense of duty to God, brethren, in a storm, we will stand, no matter what it is. God helps us master ourselves to help others. We won't compromise and we teach others not to compromise the truth. And we reach out to our destination and we pursue that destination to the kingdom of God. And brother, if you have that sense of obligation within you to fulfill your calling, you will not fail. You will succeed. And you will fully yield to God's word and his spirit in your life to lead you. And if you have this sense of duty, brethren, you're going to escape the troubles that are going to come in the future. Because God will deliver you from them. You know, that next code word is honor. Honor. What does honor mean? This is what honor means, brethren. Consideration due. Respectful regard, cause of esteem, or revere. You know, the Bible says this, you don't have to turn to it, but in Psalm 89, verse 6 through 7, it says, For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. That's us, brethren. He's greatly to be feared or revered or honored in the, the assembly of the saints. To be held in reverence by all those around him. Again, do we honor God, brethren? As we hold God in high honor and regard, brethren, we will follow him with more dedication. If we honor God, we will follow his path and his way. And if we have that desire, brethren, to fulfill duty, our obligation to God, and we honor God, God will strengthen us to help us to, to make a goal of his kingdom. He will strengthen us in the time of battle. And we'll rise up and God will you know, allow us to fly when other people you know, become weary. And God will not only help us to do that and strengthen us, brethren, he will fight for us. He will find our battles. And brethren, of all people, God deserves your honor. He deserves your honor. For what he's done for you and me. All of us is, you know, should be honoring God because he deserves our honor and our worship of him. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 over here. In Hebrews chapter 12, you know, Paul talks about God over here. There are other scriptures that talk about how high God is and how he is to be honored and how he is to be praised. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25, here Paul says, he says to the church of the general assembly of the brethren that were scattered abroad, he said, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape, who escaped or refused him who spoke on earth? Of course, when, when God spoke from, from Mount Sinai and he thundered, you know, from Sinai, the people ran because they were afraid uh, and the ground shook. You know, Paul says, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. But we better honor that voice that speaks to us from heaven. And in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. God's got, his voice is reverberating not only here to us upon the earth, but in heaven itself. And he says, now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Brethren, if we 
honor God, truly honor God, we won't be shaken loose. But if we do not honor God, we will be shaken loose like all the other riffraff of, of society that masquerades uh, around as though they do honor God. And we will fall by the wayside. And Jesus himself said that if we love God, we should also then love our neighbor as ourselves. Those are the two great commandments that remember Jesus Christ spoke of. We love God first, and then we love our neighbor. And Peter, when he came, he taught, he said, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So the Bible talks about how we need to learn to honor all men and respect all men. And the Bible says, brethren, if we honor God, he will honor us. If we do not honor God, he will not honor us. No matter what we might think. And some people have this idea that, you know, it doesn't matter uh, what we do, that you know, God just looks down and, and is going to sort of pat us on our pointed head. There, there, you didn't mean it. Well, brother, God wants us to grow up and realize that he holds us accountable. Christ said, the words we speak. We're going to be held accountable for it. So, brother, we honor God. He will honor us. He will lift us up. Eli, by the way, is an example of someone that God raised up uh, in, in, in Israel, and he gave him opportunity to lead Israel. And Eli let his boys uh, begin to uh, deal with, with Israel. And you remember that Eli's sons desecrated the offices that they held, they misuse offerings and sacrifices. Uh, they commit adultery. They, they stole. And then finally, God came to Eli and basically said to Eli, look, now's the time of reckoning. And God told Eli, he says, look, you know, where's my honor? You, you've been very lenient on your sons. You haven't done anything about your sons. And so God punished Eli because he did not honor God by taking care of his own sons. And, and God told uh, Eli then, he says, if you honor me, I will honor you. If you don't honor me, I'm not going to honor you. So once again, in that situation, by the way, you know, Eli was not honoring God by how he dealt with his own family. So, brethren, we need to honor God, not only ourselves, but our families need to honor God. We have a responsibility to our children, even, to teach them to honor God and to have an honor of God. The third word, you know, that was again engraved on that West Point coat of arms was country. And what does that mean? Now, of course, MacArthur was talking about the United States, loyalty to the United States, to a particular sovereignty or government, with a constitution that, you know, has certain laws that need to be obeyed, that the soldier was a custodian of those things uh, so that the country itself could realize its vision. But you know, the church of God is, is, a, is a country as well, is a nation. We are the Israel of God. You know, we're, we're of course, uh, the spiritual version of Israel. We had the physical Israel and the wilderness, and now it's the church of God, which is Israel, the Israel of God. And Jesus Christ, brethren, said that his kingdom was not of this world. But he said, I will build my church, which was the, the Israel of God. Later, Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven. And of course, here upon the earth is where God's church is and God's family is. But our citizenship is in heaven. And very soon, Jesus Christ is going to bring his leadership down to this earth, establish his kingdom upon the earth. 
And then he's going to begin to dole out the responsibilities to all those who've been called in this time who have been faithful. The patriarchs of old, brethren, they were sojourners. Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 11 is sort of a hall of fame of all of the, the who's who of, of those who were faithful through the ages, the men and women who were faithful through the ages, from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob, all the way through Moses and David and others that suffered great loss, and Sarah and, and you know, Rahab and others that were, were very faithful to God, proved themselves to be faithful to God. But you know, they, it says that they died having not received the promises. But they looked to a city whose builder and maker, you know, was God. That city that was not made with hands. Of course, the New Jerusalem. We know that that New Jerusalem is going to be eventually come down out of heaven after the millennium of Christ. When Christ yields his family up to the Father. So, brother, we are part of, of as the patriarchs were, of an unseen country right now. And we're sojourners until it comes. And, you know, this country, like the United States, has a dream. What is the dream of, of the, the America? The dream of America is, is prosperity. The dream of America is freedom. You know, those are probably the two greatest things about America. Freedom and prosperity and happiness. And you know, those things are mentioned you know, within the Declaration of Independence, quite frankly. are spelled out there. Do you know that the Israel of God has a vision as well? It has a dream. I have a dream. The Bible talks about this dream of one day all of us sitting under our fig tree. A part of the song that was sung in the special music was that, that we would have peace. Uh, and I, I, I dream of peace. A peace not just in the world, brethren, but peace among God's people. I look for that. You know, I've been in the church uh, now since 1968. I've seen a lot of battles. A lot of battles. I've been in a lot of battles. Uh, and usually, you know, you, they kind of creep up on you. But you've got to stand up to those things that, that arise from time to time. You know what, brethren? I, I get tired of fighting the battles. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you do too. I look to the time when there will be no more battles. That God's people will get along from one side of the world to the other. There'll be no, no more schisms, no more splits. When we'll all be under Jesus Christ. And of course, if there's any question then of who's in charge, we got a problem, Houston. <laughs> I think Christ is going to do some straightening it up. If anybody doubts his uh, right to make decisions. But brother, we have a great vision. Uh, a time when, when there'll be no more death, no more dying, no more suffering. It's quite a vision, isn't it? You know, as a soldier in Jesus Christ, I fight until that vision is realized. I don't want any more battles, but brother and I, I'm ready to rise and fight if we have to. Until we get there. Until we arrive. I think MacArthur was right. He said, duty, honor, and country are three hallowed words. They reverently tell him you what you want to be, what you can be, and what you will be. Those three words. I want to read you a little bit more about what he says here. I promised myself I would not get emotional, by the way, uh, in this particular sermon. He says to these cadets, yours is a, is a profession of arms. 
the will to win. The sure knowledge that in war there is no substitute for victory. That if you lose, the nation will be destroyed. That the very obsession of your public service must be duty, honor, and country. You see how that relates to us, brethren? We can't lose. We can't lose. We have a, an obligation to win with God's help. We can't let down. We have to keep pushing forward to the kingdom of God. He said others, others will debate the controversial issues, national and international. He's saying that his soldiers, others are going to be debating these things in the, in the country. And look what's happening today, you know, in the United States about who's going to be the next president. That's not what a soldier's duty is, to, to pay attention to that. And brother, it's not our, our duty to pay attention to that either. Because we're apolitical. We don't care. God is the one who makes those decisions anyway, doesn't he? He says, others will debate the controversial issues, national and international, which divide men's minds. But serene, calm, aloof, you stand as the nation's war guard as its lifeguards from the raging tides of international conflict, as its gladiators in the arena of battle. For a century and a half, you have defended, guarded, and protected its hallowed traditions of liberty and freedom, of right and justice. Let civilian voices argue the merits or demerits of our processes of government, whether our strength is being sapped by deficit financing indulged in too long, by federal paternalism grown too mighty, by power groups grown too arrogant, by politics grown too corrupt, by crime grown too rampant, by morals grown too low, by taxes grown too high, by extremists grown too violent, whether our personal liberties are as firm or complete as they should be, these great national problems are not for your professional participation of defense. From your ranks come the great captains who hold the nation's destiny in their hands the moment the war toxin sounds. The, lay, the long gray line has never failed us. He says your guidepost stands out like tenfold beacon in the night, duty, honor, and country. You know, and, and brethren, how does that apply to us again? We see that clearly. We're not to get entangled in the, the affairs of the world. You know, we go. We don't go out to fight in wars, physical wars. We're, we're called to fight physical battles in the army of God. And again, our duty is to keep aloof of what's going on in the world. We need to know what's going on out there, but we don't become a part of it. Well, become a part of this world and the, the society that we're living in. We're called to a higher purpose, brother. We, we don't involve ourselves in those things. The most important thing that we have, brethren, is to fight the battles that need to be fight, fought and to preach the gospel to the world of the good news of the coming kingdom of God. And we only have to fight the battles because there are voices on this planet that don't want us to to preach the gospel. There would be no battle if they just let us have free concourse to do that, would, would there? But we have to fight those battles. But we have to continue to, to preach the gospel. And unless we preach the gospel, brethren, and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children of the fathers, as Malachi says, God will smite this earth with utter destruction. We have a duty. An obligation to this world and to God, brethren. Now, MacArthur concluded his speech. He said, the shadows are lengthening for me. He said he was 82. He died two years later. He said, the twilight is, is here. My days of old have vanished, tone and tense. They've gone glimmering through the dreams of things that were. That memory is one of the wondrous beauties, watered by tears and co coaxed 
and caressed by the smiles of yesterday. I listened to this. I listened then, but with thirsty ear for the witching melody of faint bugles blowing reveille, of far drums beating the long roll. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry, the strange, mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, I come back to West Point. Always there echoes and re-echoes duty, honor, and country. Today marks my final roll call with you. But I want you to know that when I Across the river, my last conscious thought will be of the court. I bid you farewell. So he concluded his speech to the cadets. So I've been, every time I think of the Bay Area, I'll think of you. Think of the faithful who stood firm in the battles. I'll think of the Doug Bobharts. I'll think of the Mrs. Martin. I'll think of all of those who died in the fight. Many others that I too many to even mention, rather, who have been faithful. Stand by this code, this spiritual code. Duty, brethren. We're obliged to serve God for what He's done for us. Honor. Honor God because He deserves the honor from us and country. Our kingdom isn't of this world, brethren. But our citizenship is in heaven to be revealed when Jesus Christ returns the second time and establishes his kingdom in the world tomorrow. And one day, brethren, in the kingdom of God, when that is established, I want to make sure that you and I stand there together. Joe and I love you all. I bid you farewell. Fellow servants. <laughs>